Yeah. Am I under what you said? Oh, yeah. I said yeah. yeah. That's Go ahead. Abstract entities exist. Great. Anyone else besides that? Yes, Philippos. They exist independent of our minds. <laughs> Outstanding. So there's something about independence when it comes to abstract objects. What else? Well, anyway, you're right. They exist. So I would say, uh, roughly speaking, there are three aspects to mathematical Platonism. There are three aspects of mathematical Platonism in the metaphysical sense. Number one, that they exist, that objects exist, so there's an existence aspect to it. And secondly, as you said, there is an independence aspect to it as well. Now, independence, uh, in what sense? Independent to what? Hello, Robert. Independent to independent in, in what sense? Minds. Independent with respect to minds and yeah. what else? Okay. All right. So independent with respect to minds are uh, linguistic practices and uh, well cognizers to begin with. So that's true. And also another uh, another aspect of mathematical Platonism is only said to be abstractness and thing and uh, uh, James mentioned. So, what's, what's abstractness? What do we mean by saying that objects are abstract and not, say, concrete? Any idea? Okay, what's so, what's, what's, what can we say about concrete objects like tables and chairs? What's characteristic about these kind of entities, these familiar entities? Jim? I can kick them. You can kick them, so you can touch them, feel them, sense them, they're experiential. Uh, they are causally efficacy. They are not causally inert like abstract uh, entities. That's an interesting characteristic. So abstract objects are those objects 
that are somehow causally inert. Uh, you, you don't really bump into numbers and say, oh, I, I think I'm experiencing five there, or something like that. So there is, that's the third characteristic about uh, when it comes to mathematical Platonism. And nominalists are those people who basically deny the metaphysical thesis um, that Platonists hold. Different variants, this is just a simplified sort of picture. So I think now we can better appreciate, or at least have a better sense of what our topic will be about. I say, a bit counterintuitively, that Carnap, who is an anti-metaphysician, is actually a methodological Platonist, a methodological mathematical Platonist, specifically for, with respect to numbers that I'll be considering as our kind of abstract entities. So I think what's important to there is methodological, it's not just Platonism, as I sort of mentioned over here. And also I say that there are two, at least two aspects of this kind of methodological Platonism. One, the linguistic aspect, and second, the semantic. More on that towards the end. Um, all right, so let's move on to my goals of this talk. And I'm going to show one, that Carnap is in fact a, a methodological or sort of a linguistic Platonist. But secondly, also I want to show that this neutrality in the nominalist Platonist debate is preserved. But that's a, a bit of a technical term there, neutralism. What is neutralism? Does anyone have some rough idea of what neutrality might be when it comes to karna? Neutralism in respect to, yes, Jamie. It doesn't take in a stance either way on metaphysical issues. Exactly. So when it comes to the metaphysical motivations uh, to maybe talk about numbers, or whether they exist or not, or whether choosing a physicalist language over a phenomenal language, Carnap has no ontological thesis to back that up, but only pragmatic motivations. So he uses this principle of tolerance and says something like, uh, you can choose whatever language you want to, so long as you present clear syntax and ways of talking about that language, but avoid any philosophical or, or ontological um, motivations for those languages. So he remains neutral when it comes to, you know, Platonism, nominalism, physicalism, or uh, phenomenalism, or maybe non-Euclidean logical geometry and Euclidean geometry, and thinks that you can choose these languages only based on pragmatic considerations. That should give us some rough idea about his neutralism, rather ontological neutralism. And that might seem to disagree with our first part of the, the talk, which is um, his methodological Platonism. If he, if he is inclined towards Platonism, doesn't that negate his neutrality? And I would say no, because the, the, he's not a Platonist in the normal sense. This, he, he might have inclinations, but that doesn't mean he's, he's going to abandon his neutrality when it comes to the ontology. So really, so really in the first part, I, I sort of show that Platonist mathematics, sorry, uh, methodological Platonist usually could, uh, says something about a linguistic thesis and also a semantic thesis. I would also say an epistemological thesis, but I won't be talking about that. And secondly, I would say that Carnap's mutual position is still okay, despite the first claim. So here's an overview of the talk. In section one, I'll be talking about the philosophical motivations that led Carnap to even uh, to, to present his famous article. Anyone take a guess what article am I talking about? Excellent, David. Yeah, so Empiricism, Semantics, and Ontology, 1950 article, which was sort of a response to empiricists who were so basically very surprised by certain works that Carnap did, in his, in his, especially in his 1940s on semantics. And they were very um, worried about Carnap. Well, Carnap, you're not being as much anti-metaphysical as we thought you were. And also, it seems that your empiricism is betrayed by certain works that you've done. So that will be the first section. That will be, uh, we will be talking about it in the first section. And in the second section, I'll actually introduce Carnap's famous internal external distinction, which is a distinction that he makes in his EPSO, Empiricism and Semantics and Ontology paper, to actually mitigate the conceptual confusion that empiricists have with regard to Carnap's semantic analysis or explications of 1940. More about that as we progress. 
And finally, section three is the very controversial part of this talk. I would say not so controversial, I, I hope. Uh, and I, I will basically have a discussion on section three uh, with all of you and just sort of get to see where we can all go with um, certain interesting claims that I say that Karnak, in a way, numbers are objective. They are non-linguistic entities, and they're also uh, well, mind independent and objective. So that's that's strange. That seems a full-blown Platonism over there, and yet he's neutral. So we'll talk more about that towards the end. Now let's begin with section one: the problems of uh, the problem of abstract entities. I want to say something about Karnak prior his sort of uh, huge work logical syntax concerning syntactic approach to philosophy. I think by 1928, in his off bar, the logical syntax of the world, Carnap was not so metaphysical as people think, he, as, as he was later on in 1932 in the elimination of metaphysics. He says in his biograph autobiography that, in fact, he used to think that metaphysical questions were basically sort of immune to scientific analysis. And they were basically non-science. And it's only through Wittgenstein's Criterion influence that he makes this further radical step in 1932 to say that, well, it's not just non-science, but actually metaphysical utterances are cognitively or referentially, uh, in terms of uh, sort of substantive claims, are actually empty and meaningless. They might have emotive emotive or motivative meaning, but, but he still goes with the radical stats. And they don't, don't really talk about any substantial issues concerning the world. So that's very radical about Carnap that we have to keep in mind, and he is committed to that sort of anti-metaphysical attitude. Now, by 1934, especially, he, he becomes pretty famous by his work on logical syntax of language. The main motivation for such a, such a um, such a task was to basically reconceptualize philosophy, provide an explication of philosophy as this sort of syntactic uh, theory of some object language. Um, now what that really means is that you have certain problems occurring in our you know, everyday sort of semantic questions, like what is the meaning of that, or questions concerning truth. And Carnap's objective was to change or translate those meaning questions or semantic questions to what, we, what he called syntactic questions, to formal syntax, in fact. Uh, to give you an example of a semantic uh, statement that someone could say, he or she could say, I don't know, the expressions, the expression five and the expression th or sign three plus two uh, mean the same, uh, mean the same. And someone else could say, the expression five and the expression three plus two do not mean the same, but are the same number. Now, both are correct, but there's ambiguity there in the semantic sentences. And you have strange things like mean, that means that could lead to some sort of metaphysical worry. So Carnap was, in, in trying to sort of avoid pseudo problems and trying to avoid ambiguity, he, he wanted to translate as much as he could semantic sentences concerning meaning and truth and whatnot to syntactic um, counterparts. Uh, but I think it was too restrictive of a conception of philosophy. Uh, in fact, he was influenced by Tarski especially uh, his famous work on the concept of truth and logical languages. Um, and he was influenced by Tarski, and a lot of work was being done in the formal semantic, on, in terms of formalizing semantics by Polish logicians in the 1940s. And so Carnap himself, I guess, using his own principle of tolerance, was able to move on from his sort of uh, conservative conception of philosophy and liberalized his conception of philosophy to include uh, work in uh, semantics, formalized semantics, which he had the sort of right sort of logical techniques to actually do some work. And in these sort of works, the logical analysis of some language 
uh, introduction to semantics, for instance, he was able to provide explications or a sort of analysis of concepts like analyticity, work more on truth, and make some conceptual advancements in using the semantic analysis. But the problem was, and this is where this very empiricist had a great problem, was that Carnap, in trying to provide semantic analyses or explications, brought in this new vocabulary. Basically, talk about properties and propositions was fair game for Carnap. He saw no problem with that, but empiricists are like, what are you doing, Carnap? You're bringing in stuff that seems very metaphysical at times. Abstract objects, propositions, don't do that to us, essentially. And by, especially by meaning and necessity, uh, 1947, Carnap even has very explicit sentences such as propositions are extra linguistic, non-mental and objective entities. And that seems to really undermine, or appear to undermine some of Carnap's anti-metaphysical and empiricist commitments. So in 1950, he wrote a paper called ESO. And uh, in this paper, he, well, he reprinted this paper with the second edition of um, Meaning and Necessity, which was in 1956, uh, to sort of let the empiricists know that there really shouldn't be too much of a worry over here. And uh, what was the worry? Well, you guys tell me, what do you think was the worry for Carnap by talking about abstract entities. Why would that be a problem for Carnap? Suddenly he talks about propositions and, uh, yes, Jamie? He wants to be allowed to do that kind of talk about abstract entities okay. existing without committing to a metaphysical position. Right, so why were, why were empiricists uh, unhappy with Carnap's talk of abstract entities uh, by you know, saying strange stuff about propositions? I said in the worry for an empiricist. Yes, Jamie? Because abstract entities are grounded in experience. Perfect. So abstract entities, as Jamie says, are not grounded in the given, which is a spooky term to go just use the less experience. Um, in, in a non-metaphysical way, uh, so abstract entities being causally inert uh, seems to be a problem because what exists for a lot of empiricists are those sort of things that we can that are causally well active in a way, that we can touch and feel. We, can, we couldn't ground these strange entities in our empiricist frameworks. That's one worry. And the second worry is, I guess, a metaphysical commitment worry. Uh, when he describes the nature of propositions as being objective, extra-linguistic, that seems to sort of betray his euphemism, I would say. So let's dig in a bit more in the first one. So essentially, there is no basis in experience, as Jamie said, and the result is empiricists are very nominalistic towards these, sort of nominalistic towards these sort of entities. Uh, but of course, this presumes that sort of relations are all, are all, all uh, are exhausted by all and only causal relations, and that's the presumption, I would say. Well, of course, you know, relations could be log logical, mathematical as well. Just because we have this bias towards what we feel doesn't mean that relations are exhausted by causal, causal relations alone. So that's something to think about. And in terms of the metaphysical worry, it seems to sort of unintentionally commit Carnap to some sort of metaphysical, mathematical Platonism when he describes the nature, uh, which seems to again undermine his brutality. But of course, that sort of presumes that if just because you talk about entities being objective and whatnot, um, doesn't mean that you are sort of inclined towards metaphysics. In, in fact, Carnap thinks that tables and chairs are objective. Well, after images could be, well, they're not objective. They're in your head. But in a very commonsensical way, these things are objective for Carnap, and that's all that there is, what he means by objective. So more about that as we progress. And I guess this is section two. So we'll spend some time over here. Uh, but before we do so, any questions so far with regards to question one? Is there something that seems to be unclear? Maybe, maybe we could discuss for a while. So any questions? Do we like Carnap's anti-metaphysical stance? No? Anything 
Yes. Uh, yes, David. So why for card app would after images not be objective, like chairs, tables, numbers, propositions are? Right. So, well, why why are tables objective and why aren't off image? What is an off image? Well, basically, if I you know put this in front of the sunlight and stare at the sun and then close my eyes, I'll maybe see some stuff in front of me. But scientists or psychologists or whatnot will sort of explain to us that what I see is something private to me and it's not public. The after image is in my mind uh, and it's, it's a result of some sort of complex psychological uh, uh, you know, mechanism. But it's not real in the sense of, or it doesn't exist outside my own uh, uh, cognition. So he, Carnap would just go and stick to some sort of obvious explanation when it comes to objectivity in a very Schlick type manner. Schlick says that whatever <laughs> kind of exists in terms of the causally active stuff is um, sort of commonsensical. Mountains exist. Mr. Zeus probably doesn't exist. You know, I went up there and saw it in the mountain. I didn't see the sort of figure described over there. Um, unicorns probably don't exist. Giraffes exist, but the metaphysician would say, well, of course they exist in this obvious manner, but we want to know if it exists, it exists in something more robust, and Carnap would say, well, I don't even think that's a clear question to begin with. How about you explain to me what you mean uh, when you ask that question, provide you sort of ways to sort of explain to me how something uh, would count as evidence for or against this, this sort of a proposition. So Carnap's very skeptical about that for um, in, against metaphysicians who want to know, want to ask the further question, well, but is it really real? Is this chair really real? It's real in one sense, but what about the metaphysical sense and kind of sidestep stuff? Is that is it clear? Um, any more questions? I guess I could move on to the second section. So Carnap, in trying to sort of get away with the sort of objections that empiricists had with Carnap, he conceptually introduces this philosophically interesting distinction called, or known in the literature as the internal-external distinction. Now, could anyone, um, well, internal with respect to what? External, external with respect to what? What are we talking about? I'm not doing it, but... <laughs> linguistic <laughs> frameworks? Yes, linguistic frameworks, that's perfect. I guess there's a formal character of language that's sort of captured when he says linguistic frameworks. He's not talking about natural languages like English in its natural form, I guess, but really formalizing languages, making things as exact as they can. And normally he refers to them as linguistic frameworks, Sometimes people refer to them as language forms or formal language forms. I guess for this talk, we'll just call it language. And that's what we mean when we say language from Carnap. But that's correct. So there are two types of questions Carnap thinks people can ask with respect to a given language, say a physicalistic language that he talks about some pragmatic motivation. Or, um, I don't know, the is in scientific language that augments a number language where you have talk of numbers introduced in this augmented language. Now, you can ask two types of questions, says Carnap. One within the language itself, and one perhaps independent of the language. These are the two types of existential questions. Now, could some, and of course, the internal questions are perfectly fine for Karna. He, he says they are legitimate. Sort of obvious questions are perfectly genuine, according to Karna. They have theoretical content. The sentences, uh, the terms of the sentences actually refer to objects um, in the world. Ch tables and chairs in terms of the thin language. Uh, numbers in terms of the number language, or arithmetic, and what not. So, that's interesting. And then you have the external question, which could be problematic, well, which is problematic. And he, he thinks that the external question with respect to language, the question that, that are entirely independent of language, are, are misguided, are result from some sort of confusion about language itself. So that's kind of interesting. But before we talk more about 
these distinctions. Could someone give me an example of an internal statement? Uh, with regard to anything. Any examples? Yes, Jamie. There are numbers, or there are <laughs> infinite primes. Oh. Awesome, great. So it's a good thing you're reading the handout. Um, right, so in a way, if you ask the mathematician, hey, uh, math guy, or, or you know, whatever, um, you know, do numbers exist? And he will tell you, well, of course they do. If you're doing arithmetic, that's, that's already there to begin with. That's very fundamental. Numbers, of course they do exist. And someone could say, well, what about, are there infinitely many primes? Well, let me think, yes. And maybe you could come up with a theorem that's traceable all the way back to some basic axioms and logical rules, and say that the language of arithmetic says that it's true that there are infinite number of primes. So that's kind of the obvious sense that Carnap, call, um, that Carnap gives to the internal questions. Of course, some questions could be still difficult, like the twin prime conjecture, which says that um, well, people can ask the question, are there infinitely many twin primes? And the twin prime, according to, well, by definition, is, is, is a pair of primes that differ uh, with only two. So for instance, the first prime is, uh, well, can anyone guess? First pair would be what? The smallest pair of primes. Three and five, perfect. So three and five are primes, and the difference is two. Uh, what about the second pair? Uh, five is a pair. Yes. Eleven, then? Thirteen. Eleven, thirteen would be the third one, I guess. Uh, that's right, eleven and thirteen. And the second one would be? Five and seven, perfect. Um, and so, as you go down, it becomes harder to find pair of primes that differ with only two. Uh, and it seems to some mathematicians that maybe there are not infinite primes, but some people think that there are, but they still have to prove, I'm not sure if they have proven it, I'm not sure, but they still have to prove. This is not a trivial question, but it's still an answerable question through the mechanisms of the language of arithmetic. Um, and, and Carnap would call all of these existential questions in the internal sense of the language to be genuine and legitimate. Now, Carnap thinks that when, obviously, when metaphysicians ask questions, uh, do numbers exist, or I don't know, does five exist? They are not really talking about this internal sense of language question. What are you left with? The external sense of language. And he thinks that Metaphysicians want to maybe ask the question, do numbers exist, you know, independent of arithmetic language? Can we know a priori before the construction of some good syntax of arithmetic that do numbers exist? Um, I know they exist in this sense, but I don't care about this sense. I care about this language independent sense of existence. Uh, that could maybe motivate us to construct arithmetical language sort of give us a theoretical reason to say, you know, numbers do exist, metaphysically speaking, and that's why maybe we should learn more about their properties, and let's construct a system. And Carnap's like, no, I don't, I don't care about these extra reasons. In fact, I don't think you can even explain to me what those reasons what would mean to begin with. And he thinks that we should just simply uh, select a language for its pragmatic, uh, for pragmatic reasons, whether it's efficient for the scientific language or other the world, whether it's uh, just just has more utility, and you can get rid of that language forms by just mere usefulness. Um, another pragmatic consideration. So he is very skeptical about the ontological sense of the question. In other words, really exist? Does five really exist? Or wait, in terms of the thing language, does it chair really exist? That's the sort of external question that the metaphysicians seem to be asking. Um, and Carnap says he can't even find a sort of theoretical interpretation of the external question. Uh, and what he is left with is a practical interpretation, a sort of question that you can still ask about language, but in a practical sense. Which is, instead of asking, do numbers really exist? He suggests that you should ask, 
shall we engineer a, a, a sort of a, shall, shall we explicate or engineer a language to speak about numbers, arithmetic really? And well, how do you go about answering that practical question? Well, you see if it's useful for scientific discourse or not. Quine would say, well, it seems indispensable to mathematical, you know, sort of structures or numbers are indispensable to scientific discourse, so we should have it. And kind of would say, yeah, we should have it, but it doesn't mean that we sort of attribute to them some sort of ontological reality on top of the obviousness. Um, now, any questions about this? I know I've said quite a lot about this. That seems, that seems troublesome. Is that characteristic, characterization of metaphysicians fair or already simplified? What, what do your intuitions tell us? Like, it feels like a lot of met metaphysicians would know what they're talking about. Any, any sort of, uh, you know, um, objections to this picture of language and asking questions concerning existence? As Wittgenstein always says, take your time. <laughs> Are we all uh, Cardapian or? <laughs> <laughs> yes, David? Uh, explanation. I guess that was enough. So, okay. oh. uh, <laughs> uh, uh -huh. so I mean, I don't want to derail your presentation. That's fine, one, you have time. Okay, one objection to that is like it violates the principle of compositionality of okay. language. Okay. So, like that the meaning of like a sentence or proposition is the combination of its parts and how they're put together. So if you say that something like "Are there chairs?" is either like meaningless or a uh, pragmatic question of like should we introduce the word "chairs" into our language? Right. Then it can't account for how that unit, that proposition or whatever, "Are there chairs?" when it's embedded in sentences like "Are there chairs in the room?" because it is either meaningless or a pragmatic question by itself. In that one sense, according to Carnap, when you embed it in another proposition. And all of a sudden, you violate the principle of compositionality because you're saying it has a different meaning, that unit of, of language. I don't know if I've made that clear at all, but um, if, if the meaning is the words and how they're put together, then you're saying they have a different meaning when they're in another sentence, but that would violate this principle that they would have to have the same meaning just given. Uh, I'm not sure how. how it's a David Manley that makes that objection. Uh, oh, that, that's interesting. I, yeah. How that would, how changing meaning necessarily violates the principle that you're suggesting. Uh, because if their meaning is just the words and how they're put together, then you're saying they would have this different meaning in this other context, but they can't have that other meaning. Well, um, it's always dependent on just yeah. that unit. So uh, you want to make sort of advancements in terms of meaning, and uh, I don't see how that's how that would be um, problematic. You could just say that you may be wrong initially. I mean, hey, you might have done wrong, but you, yes, wait. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled by that objection. Um, there's no reason why current app would not have a linguistic framework to be semantics or be part of composition. Right, but semantics is always something within the linguistic framework. Um, yeah, um, and if, if you wanted to, you could, you could, you could construct a linguistic framework to semantics as opposed to non-composition. But if you're talking about a no, um, I have to be able to use the words chair outside in a particular semantic framework, and then at the end, I don't even know how to express the word. Um, yeah. So, so there's, there's, if you say he's committing himself to a non non conversational semantics, that's just simply false. Um, you can adopt a linguistic framework for the conversational semantics. Right. I think what's important to note that Carnap is a pluralist in terms of even explicating semantics for a particular language. So uh, given pragmatic motivation for why this principle is useful, and he would have this experimental approach to various uh, possible semantic uh, languages. And so he would be, he wouldn't have any principle to stop him in, in theory to adopt a language where someone like the, the objector would be satisfied. Um, and he doesn't think that language is true or correct, but rather more or less useful given your ambitions and motivations for scientific inquiry. 
so it's an interesting point that you said, in a way, the worry doesn't really even arise. Um, so if I could just like clarify. So there's no problem because are there chairs and are there chairs in a movie theater or, or in this room or whatever? There's no problem that are there chairs has different meaning in the one context or the other because they're two different linguistic frameworks and they don't both have to like adhere to that compositionality principle. One could I'm not. Actually, I don't. I don't what are the two different things? So, 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 yeah, so tell me the two different things. Well, no, no, I was thinking that was your response. No. Okay, so then maybe the problem is just that I haven't made the, the objection clear in the first place. Okay, what? Are there chairs is one, like, unit of language, right? And the meaning of this unit has to be defined in terms of each part of that unit are there and chairs and how they're put together, right? The order. That's the principle of compositionality. So if you have the meaning of are there chairs defined in terms of the parts and how they're put together, then it would have to have that same meaning in any other context because the compositionality principle says the meaning is just the parts and how they're put together, which means it would have to have the same meaning when it's in another context of are there chairs in the room. But if the meaning in the first case is either meaningless or practical, then how does it make sense to say are there chairs in the room? That's not a practical question or a meaningless question. Okay. Wait, 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 just, um, on the principle of cause, um, Carnap is free. He says yes. If you want to construct a linguistic framework in which that principle is old, go ahead. Um, there's nothing that says you have to. It doesn't have to. Secondly, um, if you're saying that um, the same word, the same sound, can't have different meanings in different contexts, then that's just simply false. So <laughs> as a matter no, of, of, really of, of English. Yeah, tri 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 trivially false. So, yeah. so um, here's what Carnap would say. Um, um, if you're going into, you know, if if if, if, if you want to know, um, 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 are there any chairs? Sure, you know, that, you know, lots of context in the show with the meaning. And now what he wants to say is, no, um, what I don't mean, you know, you know, we have this, you know, Thing language we use to talk about the world, and and um, the, the question are, within that linguistic framework, the question are there are chairs makes perfect sense. Now, if you say no, 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 I'm not talking. I don't want to know whether within that thing language framework, with with its, its semantics, whether that sense comes up true. I want to know extra linguistically in this in in in, in you know, the metaphysical question. Um, um, there he would say, well, actually, you know, there isn't any such question. Okay, yeah, but then he's saying that the semantic value of this unit is different in these two cases, which is eschewing the principle of compositionality. That's the objection. If you're saying this yeah, one unit has a different that's semantic that's not, value. That's not continuing because you're just saying the same thing over and over again. So then I'm not understanding your response. That's correct. Right. Well, yeah, what we could uh, discuss this towards the end as well in the last yeah. maybe five minutes or so. In the meantime, actually, thanks for the, the objection. Yeah. All right, so any more questions? I guess I'm looking forward to... Um, okay. Awesome, great. So, um, so in a way, the requirement for meaningful statements from Carnap is that we should be able to determine in advance what would constitute as evidence for or against the proposition. We already said that. And basically, if you go back, he wants to sort of sort of give an interpretation to the external question that's practical. In a way, he changes the debate from this ontological, troublesome debate and converts them into kind of practical questions about choosing a language instead of asking, are numbers really real? Or are things really real? That's the sort of interesting shift that he makes to explain in just how they need to be um, So I guess one worry that comes to my mind in ESO especially is, after going through all of this, after knowing that existence is in language-dependent manner, does it seem to you that numbers, for instance, as instance of uh, abstract objects, would, would, would numbers for Karnat be just mere ways of speaking? After all, existence is in language-dependent manner. Is it just that there are, let's say, linguistic entities? Let's let's talk about that. Does it, does it give the impression that Pro Karnak 
um, he, he's quite a bit of a nominalist, and he says that, you know, existence is just a language dependent matter. Anyone? Yes, Rob? Sorry. In what sense is he a phenomenalist for posing the question in that way? Oh, I, I didn't say he was a phenomenalist. I was saying that in terms of numbers, say if he says, um, well, numbers exist because, well, existence is a language dependent matter. Uh, and uh, that's all that there is to reality. But it seems to me if you say that in existence is a language-dependent matter, so for instance, uh, you, you, when you talk about empirical things or the things over here, you use the thing language and the concept of reality or existence and the thing language is uh, empirical. And if you take the other language, arithmetic or some other logical language, the the conception of existence or reality in this language is logical. We use logical deductive rules to come to a conclusion in the deductive uh, arithmetic uh, language, and you use some sort of evidentiary kind of rules to come to beliefs about chairs that they probably exist or would not. Uh, so, but it seems in doing this, uh, exist, he, he, he seems to betray his neutralism and sort of go towards Nominalism almost. I'm sorry, I thought you said phenomenal. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Oh. So he goes to no nominalism, and it seems that his neutralism is a, again under attack in trying to defend against the sort of empiricist objections. Now it seems he's betraying, uh, well, neutralism again in a different manner when he says that existence is just a language of matter. It seems like numbers then would be just mere ways of talking. Is that all that there is to numbers? What do you guys think? What's your impression, Robert? Yes, Robert. I want to trample on the other question. Well, if you, one way of thinking about what the neutralism means is that he's trying to be neutral between different approaches to the philosophy of mathematics, right? And there are different general views of mathematics on which you might accept or reject different procedures for deciding questions about existence. And so you could say, well, I'm a neutralist, I remain a neutralist in the sense that uh, I'm not committing myself to, say, uh, an intuitionist view of what's an acceptable procedure for deciding by mathematical existence, nor am I committing myself to a formalist view. But those two views differ on practical matters of which things will be said to exist, right? Which, which equations will be said to have solution, right? Well, for some pragmatic purposes, I might wish only to accept what, what can be mathematically constructed as existing, right? In other, in other situations, I might be willing to accept uh, a language in which anything that's not logically contradictory can be regarded as existing. And so I'm still neutral uh, as far as the metaphysics of math goes. It's just that it's really up. It's really up to you which of these frameworks, or it's up to the the adherence of these frameworks to show that there's a practical reason for reasoning in the way that they do. Thank you. Great. Well, uh, what I have a question is more clarification. Perfect. Um, what if instead of asking this like about the existence of numbers, I were to ask about the existence of words? Of so words. I'm thinking of this as connecting this situation with the previous line of thought about the difference between external and internal listening. So if, if I say, uh, if, if I state this question, do words exist? Right. That, that expression, where would I put that? Inside or outside the language? That's interesting. Do, do words exist? Well, because I'm using more, I mean, I don't use numbers to inquire about the nature of numbers, but I do use words right. to inquire about right. the nature of words. So I guess another question could be do signs exist? Because we could make signs and talk about that. It just happens to be the case that we can, you know, make strange looking things or put them together and we call them a word. It's like a drawing, right? Uh, we could have easily just 
you know, uh, you know, talk about language by our sort of sign language in a way. And the question could have been asked for that: that do, does do signs exist? Um, well, what meaning could we give to this question? Do does the sign that a person who uh, talks through just signs and all can't speak? Uh, what meaning could we give to the question? Do signs exist? Um, I guess one answer could be well. So the obvious manner would be, I think, uh, you know, yeah, if, if by signs and existence you mean something like this, then there, there you go, like in Maureen, a response, where is a sign and where is another sign? Or, I don't know, if, if you could ask something more about the existence of signs, or in terms of words, well, if for a word to exist, sort of the only meaning that you can give is kind of letters over here. That's all that you can do. <coughs> but um, well, how how different would that question about words would be from <coughs> the question about the existence of numbers? I think that's a question about, I guess, natural language in a way. Uh, it's not really a question within a framework of language or outside the framework of language. Um, it's like, do, do language exist? Like, well, what does it mean? Am I going to find language somewhere lying down over here? Um, it, right, so it's, it's, it's categorically different, I would suggest, the question. And, uh, one needs to sort of elucidate what it, it would even mean to ask the question. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting but strange kind of question, I would say, but I could look more into it. Um, yes, Wayne? Can you quickly answer the question about the language? Yes. Okay. Because um, if when you ask the words exist, if what you mean is um, or does abstract entity, right? so the, the word, oh, okay. yeah, the, 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 you know, the word share um, would be an abstract entity of which every utterance is a token and every, um, uh, um, you know, every written instance is, is a token of that abstract entity, then, then he, he's clear, in meaning and necessity, and I'm doing semantics, it is useful to, to, to quantify or over abstract entities of that kind. So, so um, yeah, I adopt, I, I, I adopt a, a, a linguistic framework in which I quantify over, over entities of like that. I don't have to. So um, you, you could adopt a phenomenal language in which um, all I have is my subjective impressions and, and I would I would, I would have what I heard you say a few minutes ago, and I would have what I, what I see on the paper, um, but there wouldn't be any abstract entity of which um, those two things would be um, tokens. That wouldn't be very useful. Um, there's, there are just 10 minutes left, so I want to proceed to the final section, and I want to have a bit of discussion on this section. Um, and I hope I can at least sketch what I'm trying to say when I say mathematical fit, uh, uh, methodological fit in this. So move on to the final slide, skip one slide uh, on the page on your handout. And there's actually two really interesting quotes that I think are very essential to what I'm suggesting here. So could someone volunteer to read the first quote, quote which starts with Tim Coleman's discussion? Anyone? It's a long one. <laughs> okay. okay, awesome, Ashley. Um, in Cohen's discussion, however, he fails like most, that's the one you want me to read, right? Yes. Sorry. Right. <laughs> uh, he fails like most critics of positivism and empiricism to dis distinguish with sufficient clarity between two fundamentally different meanings of the term phenomenalism. Sometimes, and perhaps in most instances, this term refers to a certain ontological thesis, which asserts, roughly speaking, the primary reality, in the metaphysical sense, of phenomena, for example, sense data, in contrast to material objects. Phenomena, phenomenalism, in the second methodological or linguistic sense, may be understood as the proposal of a phenomenalistic language as the basis of the total language. Even before I came to Vienna, I emphasized in my book, uh, the Der Logische Aufbau, 
that although I constructed the language on a phenomenalistic basis, taking sense data or experiences as starting points, the construction did not imply an acceptance of the metaphysical thesis of phenomenalism. Well, thanks a lot. I, um, I didn't have to read it, so I feel there's a lot of uh, reading to do. Uh, so here's an instance of uh, where Carnap actually talks about the choice between physicalist language and phenomenal language. And he clearly mentions that sometimes people conflate uh, or mix up uh, the two senses of adopting a language, one could be to sort of think of you know, phenomenal language being just the correct language, having some sort of ontological motivation behind the construction. And the second reason is sort of uh, accepting the phenomenal language in the piece in his aufbau as more of a methodological or linguistic thesis. So I actually use part sort of terms like methodological and linguistic um, to even apply to our current talk in uh, mathematical Platonism, when he chooses to talk in the very well, in a similar manner, when he chooses to talk about numbers instead of phenomenal language, physical language, and he talks about numbers or the idea of augmenting a number language to the scientific language, uh, again he is doing so only in a methodological or linguistic sense. Now, I guess the question really is, well, what what really is linguistic sense? And I think there are two aspects to the linguistic sense. One is, well, of course, that you are actually preferring a language that has the, in terms of mathematics, has the vocabulary uh, to express you know, sentences like five is a number or something like that. So the, just the mere fact that you are choosing a sort of mathematical language over not even having a mathematical language in your scientific language, that is should, itself should be one part of the linguistic thesis in terms of meta methodology. But secondly, and very importantly, in terms of numbers, Carnap is even more Platonistic um, than we think. Well, besides not being metaphysical, in terms of methodology, he constructs or prefers a semantic meta language that, that allows him to construe numbers as being objective, non linguistic, and also mind independent or non mental. This is very interesting because in the in the sort of debate concerning theoretical entities, he doesn't have a, a sort of a, a more realistic inclined meta language. He also he sort of thinks that well, theoretical entities we can talk about them. That's fine. Check them out for the first part of the linguistic thesis. But theoretical entities after the ramification of the language really is basically talk about mathematical entities in a way. So he's more instrumentalist in in that debate. But over here, I would say. He's very much Platonist, besides, or well, not, well, with, in, uh, without being ontologically Platonist. He tries to provide meaning to terms like uh, objective. Well, numbers are objective in the way that they're not, well, subjective in the obvious ways, just like tables, tables and chairs are objective and after images are subjective. If you look at the rules of the language of numbers, you, you can't, you can't um, extrapolate from the rules that um, you know, numbers depend on Bob or Alice or whatnot. So he's, he's again being very obvious about the answer of the objective or subjective. Once you sort of construct a language with certain rules, uh, the, you don't figure in the truth conditions afterwards. Um, you have true or false propositions about numbers in that way. Uh, so there's an interesting passage uh, about propositions. Could someone just um, where he actually cons constructs a framework to talk about propositions. Could someone read the uh, passage from the second paragraph? He actually me mentions propositions being non-mental. He actually mentions propositions, this is it from ESO, uh, being objective and extra linguistic, uh, and actually explains what he means by that. So this is, this is a fantastic instance of what he means by those terms. I thought maybe it's best we actually see what Carnap has to say. Anyone want to volunteer for this long? Yes, Peter, awesome. You mean the uh, word starts is important? Yeah, from the second paragraph, it is important to notice. <laughs> it is important to notice that the system of rules for the linguistic expressions of the propositional framework, of which only a few rules have, there, have here been briefly indicated, is sufficient for the introduction of the framework. For example, are propositions mental events, as in Russell's theory? We look at the rules shows us that they are not, because otherwise existential statements would be performed if the mental state of the person in question fulfills 
such and such conditions, then there is a pain such that. The fact that no references to mental conditions occur in a result of statements like C, D, etc., shows that propositions, propositions are not mental entities. Further, a statement of the existence of linguistic entities, for example, expressions, classes, expressions, etc., must contain a reference to a language. The fact that no such reference occurs in the existential statements here shows that propositions are not linguistic entities. The fact that in these statements no reference to a subject, an observer or knower, occurs, so nothing like there is a P which is necessary for Mr. X, shows that the propositions and their properties of necessity, etc., are not subjective. Perfect. Uh, so this is a very interesting instance which I don't know why people I think don't read it properly or whatnot, but here you actually want us to give an extra systematic explanation of say nature of propositions presents a simple framework and says, like, well, look at the rules. I can present some other framework, but I prefer this framework for some pragmatic motivation. But now let's look at our preferred uh, explication of talk about propositions. And he says, well, if you look at the rules, there is no talk about, there's a reference to language, and in that sense, it's not linguistic. In that sense, even though existence is an external internal matter, still the terms would refer in a very neutral sense, or karna. So he is still able to uh, give an interpretation to terms like objectivity or mind independence being non-mental simply, and also uh, abstractness, uh, the way mathematical Platonists traditionally did. And yet he provides this in the very sort of obvious manner and says, well, if metaphysicians want to say something beyond that, well, they have to really explain what, they, what they're really talking about. Um, and that's a bit of a challenge for, from Karna to, to many physicians. Um, it's still open-ended. He hasn't given a categorical response. We can, we can never do it. He's like, provide clear means to talk about this. I'm listening. Um, so that's pretty much sort of the rough sketch of what I wanted to mention. Um, now let's take a, take a look at the conclusion. So Karna is a mathematical Platonist. In this linguistic sense that he sort of explained about phenomenalism and physicalism, now I think linguistic sense, I, I really think there are two aspects of it. One can sense the semantic meta language to sort of talk about the object language, and you can choose whatever language, uh, language you want to construct. Um, but the other is actually also bringing in the vocabulary. So there's not just, so you could have easily just talked about mathematical entities, numbers, blah, 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 2 plus 2 equals to 5, but in a semantic meta language, he could have been very instrumentalist, uh, sorry, nominalist leaning. He could have just said that my numbers, he could construct the rules of language such that numbers would be subjective, such that numbers could have been just linguistic helpful entities. But he didn't. He preferred to not do so because that's not conducive to scientific discourse. So in a very interesting way, he has a second uh, inclination towards Platonism without any ontological uh, inclination. And so he thinks that numbers, if you look at the rules, are in, in, in his sense, objective, referential, in, in, in a non-ontological sense, uh, and non-mental or mind-independent. That's all that they could mean when you say uh, mind-independent. Um, and uh, Carnap's linguistic methodology, methodological paganism has no ontological motivation. So I think his neutralism is preserved whilst, whilst also having interesting paganist inclinations in this or maybe slightly misleading calling him a methodological Platonist in the sense that it doesn't seem to be limited to just Platonism, which he could adopt as a methodological means. Uh, like you were saying earlier, it seems to be more to the point that you adopt whatever strategy, whatever sets of constraints happens to serve certain pragmatic interests or something like that. So the fact that he kind of adopted Platonism in sort of some of his own writings is kind of smaller to the larger point where you could actually talk about Metaphysics more broadly in a methodological sense. Metaphysics in a methodological sense. Could you elaborate a bit more? So I'm just thinking, like, I mean, you 
uh, like General Rob was saying earlier, I mean, uh, nominalism and Platonism are going to give you two different sets of kind of constraints that you can work with within mathematics, which are going to give you certain pragmatic abilities that you wouldn't have in other ones. Right. So it's not so much that you have to be a Platonist, a methodological Platonist. You could be either or, depending on your pragmatic uh, okay. preferences. And presumably, you know, it's not limited to just those two views. It could be but anything, as long as it's pragmatic. Um, so it seems like the larger picture is more about being a methodological metaphysician than being a methodological Platonist. It's oh, like okay. a, a, the larger point. Um, so that's just a, a small thing. My other thing, which might just turn out to be a constructive point, I don't we've talked about this before, but I think it might need emphasizing that it seems, at least on my reading, that Karnas really changed his view uh, throughout his career on what exactly metaphysics is. Um, in order to make this sort of interpretation square with um, you know, his, his general catalog, there's a lot of remarks he makes in earlier works, which you might have to say, like, you know, seem to be going against this and might need to be uh, emphasized the fact that he seems to have changed his mind. So, like, in the character of philosophic problems, you know, he talks about the anomalous Platonist debate. Like, you can just translate away these problems. The only reason these problems exist is because of this confusing way we phrase things. Right, right. Or, you know, I mean, his in logical syntax, where he talks about idealists and realists. Uh, debating about the true nature of animals and stuff like that, which the zoologists can ignore, right? I mean, these kind of, like, it seems like on this picture, rather, um, you know, the realists or the idealists in a methodological sense might actually have something substantial and important to say. Um, so it seems like at least some earlier work of Carnot's or something like that, those kind of pictures don't square with the one that you're getting here, which is suggesting that he changed his mind. I see. Well, I, I in terms of metaphysics, after his elimination, um, I, I don't, I don't see how he, he, his attitude is is different. Um, even when he talks about ESO, I think he provides a different way of coming to the same results uh, compared to his earlier uh, sort of ver verificationist approach to meaning, and then talk about meaning in terms of language, uh, external questions. Uh, I think the the impact seems to be uh, more or less similar in terms of metaphysics. And in other areas, I would say he has uh, changed his views quite a bit throughout. Um, but, but in terms of this anti-metaphysical attitude after Dracturian, after his the sort of Wittgensteinian influence, um, he, he seems to be committed to, to, to the same sort of effects that he had in his elimination, I would say. Uh, are you suggesting that he has changed in some interesting way? So, yeah, um, I, I think that he has. All right. um, so I, I think you're right in the sense, you know, his neutralism about um, Platonism versus nominalism on the metaphysical <coughs> aspect is certainly consistent with his earlier work. But also, I mean, it, it, there's, there seems to be several passages in a couple of his earlier articles where he seems to be basically like, we want to be done doing metaphysics, <laughs> period. Like, he seems to portray it as just kind of a useless pastime and something that's just confusing things and obfuscating real problems. Uh -huh. Seems like something, but on this picture, on uh, methodological, it seems like metaphysics has come kind of back in through the back door now. I, I, I oh, we can do it, oh, but okay. in this methodological sense. But that's really interesting. I think, I think in a way, Carnap is, look, he's still using terms like causes in his, in his introduction to philosophy of science. He's like, okay, I'll, you know what, I'll still would want people to talk about causes, but here is this scientific meaning of cause, and that there, that's all that there is that I think we can say about causes. So he's still using certain terms that metaphysicians use, and in, in a way, look, he's talking about, he's using, freely using terms like objective, mind independence, Schleck uses that in early 1930s, probably 1930s, or 20, 20, late 20s, I, I don't know. Um, and so they're, they're still using those terms, but they're always, sort of uh, explain to us what they mean by these terms. They don't want to, in, in a way, you kind of want to dismiss all talk, but it's it's so it's so kind of hard because um, certain distinctions are very subtle. So st they still want to use these terms at times. Uh, and you can sort of think of it as sort of reconceptualizing those then metaphysical terms like mind independent. You always think that means something very robustly metaphysical. 
And yet, for Carnap, that's just something common sense. What, what could mind independence mean when we say the chair is mind independent? Independent, no independently. Um, we just have a scientific answer that thinks that it thinks that mind independence and things aren't. Example being arbitrary image and chairs. Is there something more to what we can mean by mind independence? Well, let us know. Kind of, it's a sort of a question that both Schleicher and Carnap would say. So I, I think the feeling that Carnap has brought in, brought back metaphysics um, is really a result of uh, certain, certain metaphysical terms, um, but those terms have been given a reinterpretation, a kind of in interpretation that's legitimate and genuine, much like the external question, where instead of trying to provide a theoretical interpretation, you're now giving practical interpretations. Um, is there anything else that you? I think we could go on for Yeah, no. so I'll just well, he's my roommate, so we, we go back and forth. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, thank you, Jimmy. And um, anyone else? Um, Robert, yes. I, th I think my question is very closely related to Jamie's. Oh, okay. so it, it concerns why, what really justifies calling this uh, methodological, methodological view Platonism? Because it isn't a methodological view that requires uh, any sort of Platonist commitments, mm -hmm. even provisionally, right? It just says we're using a language in which we refer to numbers as objects, and we, we can translate mind independence into uh, issues that can be settled by questions like, are Smith and Jones thinking of the same number? Right? Uh, and we can say, well, really any mathematician can probably work in that way, right. but still, I'm by this methodological approach that I've just outlined, I'm not really committing myself to Platonistic answers to questions like, you know, do all the solutions to, this, to these equations exist even though no one's ever thought of them? Or does somebody have to construct them? So I'm, I, you might just say, I'm methodologically committed to this language, but not really, I'm not really using it Platonistically uh, because I, I'm not taking a position on it the really hardcore Platonist views like that, that, that tell you what the answers are to to questions that Platonists <coughs> constructed this answer differently. You're quite right. Um, I myself have struggled with the terminology uh, in terms of like should I call him a Platonist to begin with because at times Quine uh, actually called him uh, he mentions in his ESO remark Platonist with Frege and Carnap was upset about it. Like, what, Quine, what are, you, what are you doing? And Quine responded, well, you know what I mean, you know, when I said Platonist to you. I didn't really mean it in that sense. There's some, some worry over there, and uh, I think, you know, some people sort of called Carnap an empirical realist. And again, Carnap's very uneasy about the notion of empirical realist. Why are you still holding on to these terms like realist? And I think Feigl, from a historical point of view, Carnap was always very uneasy about these terms. but. I think in, 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 I think Feigl, who is it maybe I'm wrong over here, was able to sort of convince him about the terminology. Well, you, you're still um, uh, was it Schlick? Sorry, uh, that we, we can still call call ourselves empirical realists as long as we sort of explain what we mean by empirical realists. So I try to just be used to sort of historical uh, language because over here in the passage that we we read. Um, he, he uses the term methodological and um, linguistic when it comes to uh, the phenomenal language. So I was just trying to be sort of close to Carnap's choice of words, but it, it is problematic, um, as you say. Um, I, don't, I don't know, what, what, what do you think? Well, if you take the remarks that he says uh, about, say, atoms and molecules, Seriously, he says, "Well, if I, if I am asking the question, are these things real? What I'm really asking is, is it convenient to adopt a language that includes these in, in its vocabulary and has defined ways of talking about it?" Right. But you wouldn't take that. You, would you? Would it be appropriate to describe that as being sort of uh, a methodological no. realist about it's atoms not. and molecules? But that's what I'm going to write about very soon. Uh, I, I think it's interesting when it comes to the theoretical discourse, uh, 
Carnap is more sort of sort of inclined towards um, instrumentalism. Interestingly, after his Ramsey approach to theories, where you take TC a theory and basically have the conjunction of the Ramsey theory and the conditional if Ramsey sentence is true, then theory is true. Um, after that approach or, or reconceptualization of theory, uh, you, you are left with a sort of semantic meta language that interprets theoretical terms essentially being talk about mathematical entities. And so he's very interestingly in contrast to his, I would say, methodological Platonism, he's a semantic, he's more inclined, to, inclined towards a form of instrumentalism, albeit neutral, apparently. And I, Bill Demopoulos and I think Greg Levers have, Levers have sort of said the same thing through different considerations that this move is <coughs> unmotivated by Carnap. So I'm thinking more into that, that sort of issue over there, and I think Carnap made a, made a, prob well, a problematic thing when he just spoke about theoretical entities in that way. So I wouldn't call him a methodological uh, realist in the, uh, in the realist instrumentalist debate when it concerns theoretical entities. Uh, that I thought is kind of interesting and also problematic. 